All right, Second Timothy, chapter two. There's one main point I kind of want to get across this evening. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take to do it. Hopefully, not too long. And hopefully I can find the right words to express this truth. Because oftentimes what you see in Scripture is there's a balance with everything. Right? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, you know, there's a time to love and a time to hate. The Bible says there's a time for peace, there's a time for war. Everything has its proper place. Right? And, you know, I mentioned a time to love and hate. That's not what my sermon's about. But... You know, people can get too lopsided and focused just on one thing. And even in the Bible, you might sound, it might shock you to say, you know, the Bible isn't just about love. Yes, God is love. Yes, there's a lot of love. It's good to preach that. And we do preach that and we embrace that. But at the same time, there are things that we're called to hate at the same time. So we need to have the right balance knowing, hey, what should we be hating? What should we be loving? And, and separating it, rightly dividing the word of truth and getting it right so that we know you know, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. Um, same thing we are this morning, I was talking about any doctrine you can even pick, too. You want to make sure you've got the right balance. But there's some things that could lend themselves to go a little bit too extreme one way or the other because people only focus on certain verses and not on the counterbalancing verses that give you the fullness of how you ought to behave or how you ought to think or, you know, uh, some, somewhere along those lines. So what, what I'm going to be focusing in on this morning here, where the Bible says in verse 16, it says, but shun profane and vain, excuse me, profane and vain babblings. And he brings up a couple of guys, um, Hymenaeus, Philetus, and he's saying shun that. Okay, shun means I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Okay, get away from me. I'm not even going to talk about it with you. Right? That's the attitude of shunning. Just saying, nope, nope, sorry, closed door, don't want to do it. Not going to deal with it. Whereas, on the other hand, if you look down further in this chapter, it says in verse... uh, 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach patient and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God prevents, will give them repentance, acknowledging of the truth. So you might say, well, which is it, right? Are we, are we supposed to just shun people, or are we supposed to just be real humble and meek and just suffer all things and allow everything, you know? Well, you can have both. It just don't apply the one too broadly. Right? We want to have the humble, meek spirit. We want to reach a lot of people. But it's not at all costs is the thing. When there's, when there's certain areas and certain teachings and certain people that we need to shun, as the Bible teaches and as it says, then that's what we need to do. Okay, We don't want to get too one way or the other. We don't want to be too shunning of everybody. Right? And then it's like, you're not talking to anyone now because you've just shunned everybody. And you, you know, it, when, you, when you take these things and you apply them way too broadly, then you're going to get yourself into problem. But where I see, you know, modern Christianity, it's not a problem with shunning. It's more of a problem without, with, with the no shunning. Right? Christianity has gotten way too permissive and too accepting of just everything. All men are sin. All men are perversion. No standards. Everything is just come on in and, and you know, whatever. And it needs to be balanced properly with Scripture. Obviously, the good heart, the good spirit wants to reach people, right? And that is the right heart and the right spirit to have. We do want to reach the lost, and we really want to be long-suffering and merciful as God is long-suffering and merciful and have those attributes and have the heart and have the desire and really want to reach people. But let's do things appropriately according to how the Scripture tells us to do it. Let's do it right. If the Bible says that we ought to be shunning some people or some things, then let's do it. If we have a problem with that, let's, let's figure out, well, where is this applicable and where is it not? And let's not try to go too overboard one way or the other. And let the Bible dictate how we ought to behave. So, and, and I thought 2 Timothy 2, we're going to spend most of our time this evening in this passage For that very reason, because when you start off, he's saying, hey, shun this stuff. But then at the end, he's saying, basically, instruct all people and be real meek and stuff. He's kind of like, well, wait a minute. Well, yeah, I think that's a good reason why it's even in the same passage. Because he's telling you both. It's not a contradiction at all. 
It's just an appropriate ap application. Both contain in the same, you know, within, within a, a reasonable distance of each other to be teaching this whole concept saying, okay, here, you need to be able to shun this stuff, but not everything and have this type of spirit. But let's, um, I'm going to take a step back. That's, that's the concept that I'm going to be trying to express tonight. I just want to get that out. So that's the overall, you know, I have a tendency to kind of go a little bit off subject here and there. And, and that may happen and I may not. But that's kind of what the, the point is. And I want to dig into this and, and see if we all have just help the understanding of where the stop points are for these and, and kind of how to identify when should I be shunning versus not shunning and being meek and instructing. Uh, verse number 11 is where we're going to pick up, or again, kind of rereading. We read the whole chapter before the sermon started, but let's, uh, let's go back and refresh a little bit of this. Verse number 11, the Bible says, a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And these few verses here, I think are very simple statements. Okay, very simple truths. Nothing extremely complicated here. Verse 11, if we be dead with him, we shall also live. If we're dead with Christ, right? If we, if we have our faith in Christ, the Bible says that our sins are, are, are you know, crucified with him on the cross, that we're dead to sin, but because of his resurrection, we shall live with him. So if our life is hid in Christ as Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead, even so are we dead to old self, dead to our sin, but alive unto Christ. So if we are, be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Just as Jesus Christ suffered, you know, he came here first, he suffered and bled and died, but he's going to be glorified and he's going to come back and he's going to be ruling and reigning and have all of the honor that he didn't get when he came to this earth the first time. He left his glory. He left his honor in heaven when he came to this earth and he came to be a servant. He didn't come to rule and reign. But when he comes back, he's going to have all of that glory, all of that honor that's bestowed upon him. And rightfully so, not just because he's God and was God in the flesh, which is enough right there, but because of everything else that he did then for us and to save us and all that he went through um, to receive that honor. But if we suffer also, God is faithful and just to recompense us as well. And he says, hey, if you suffer for my name's sake, then you'll get rewarded for that in the kingdom of God. So when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom here on earth for that thousand years, You'll be able to rule and reign with him. You'll be set over authority and, and have rewards that will be given to you as a result of your own suffering. Amen. See, not only does God, see, God blesses us. He blesses us with a free gift of eternal life yeah. that no one has to work for. No one has to even, you don't have to suffer for it either. You just receive it for free. Jesus Christ did all the suffering for you to get that gift. But once you receive that gift, once you're born again, because you've, you've accepted eternal life from God, you have the choice of how you're going to live. And if you're going to live righteously, as the Bible says, yeah, and all that will live, uh, God, thank you. Oh, <laughs> our brain fart. Yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Shall, you will. You're, gonna, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer persecution if you choose to do what's right and separate yourself from the world and say, I'm going to live the way the Bible says to live. I'm going to read this book. I'm going to take it literally. I'm going to apply this in my life. And I am going to live holy. You will be different from the world. And as a result of being different, you will be persecuted. That's right. You will be persecuted. It's going to happen. If you suffer with him... Will also reign with him. Simple truth, right? If we deny him, he'll also deny us. Again, another simple truth. Look at verse 13, though. Again, if we, and I love showing this verse to people when we're out trying to preach the gospel and help people understand that, hey, all you have to do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That's what the Bible says. Acts 16, and they brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believing is all that's required to be saved. 
But people will say, and this is a logical question, it makes a lot of sense. So when we're talking to someone, they say, but what happens if you stop believing? Right? So in the context here, we're saying if we suffer, if we do this, if we believe not, so let's say at some point we stop believing, is God going to go back on his promise and take away your eternal life because you stopped believing? Well, no. According to this verse, it says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. If you think about it this way, it's like a husband and wife in a sense. Now, in our world, you have husbands and wives and people get divorced and, and it's done and it's over. But imagine one person wanting a divorce and the other person not and not allowing it. Right? So if we just are like unbelieving, no, I don't have anything to do with you, but you've already been married and you've got married to, you know, in this example, be like God the Father. And we're saying, nope, want a divorce? And he's going, nope, I'm abiding faithful. Nope, still, still there, still done. Right? Jesus Christ and God, you know, God makes a promise. The Bible says that God that cannot lie promised in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Eternal life is a promise that God has promised to those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ. John 5, 24, Jesus said, um, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And that's the key point is that it's that present tense, you have it. So a lot of people have this concept of, well, once I'm done with my life, based on all of the events, then I'll either get it or I won't. But that's not the way it works. The moment you put your trust in Jesus Christ, the moment you put your faith in him, you have everlasting life. You have it right then and there. So the point is, if you have something that Jesus says is everlasting, and then you don't have that anymore, and you die and go to hell, it didn't really last you forever. It wasn't really everlasting. And it's not something that's given to you at the end of your life. It's something you receive right away. So if you stop believing, hey, that's already been given to you because the moment that you believe, you had it. And it's everlasting. So if we believe, he still abides faithful. He says, yep, you believed. And I gave it to you already. It's a gift. It wasn't a contract. It wasn't, you know, you have to do this, this, and this to keep it. It was a gift. It's given. It's free. He abides faithful to that. Even if you're not faithful, he'll abide faithful. Amen. And that's a great truth to have and to know. Now, personally, I don't think it's possible for someone that truly believed in their heart, with all their heart, on Jesus Christ to stop believing. I, I don't think that, and that's a whole other story. I, again, I don't want to get too far off into rabbit trails in the sermon. I could prove that, why I believe that way, that I think it's literally impossible to stop believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying people can't doubt or have times of uncertainty, but I don't think you're ever just going to be like, well, I'm just atheist now. And I know there's people out there that, that claim, you know, they were Christian in the past and they claim to be raised. I don't think they ever really believed, though. Just like there's many people that today that say they believe in Jesus Christ, but they're not saved because they're not trusting completely in Christ. They're trusting also in themselves and their works and other things. They're not 100% have their faith in Christ for their Savior, as their Savior. So anyways, um, I'm digressing. Let's, let's continue on here. So my whole point is these are all relatively simple commands, simple statements, simple truths, simple doctrines that he's laying out. And then verse 14 says, of these things... Put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now, as we're going to continue to get into this, striving about words to no profit, you, you run into people who want to come, come apart and, and just pull apart all of these various words, and they could just get stuck on one verse. And they're going to try to pick apart every single word. And what's the point of what they're trying to do? It's for the subverting of the hearers. That's right. They're trying to undermine. Just If you just read this real plainly and pretty clearly, it's pretty clear what it's saying. It doesn't need a lot of expounding. You know, maybe some of it needs a little bit of a little bit of guidance, a little bit of teaching, but not much. I mean, you could look at it on the surface. If we deny him, he also denies us. Okay, you could go on and elaborate further on that, but... It kind of says what it says, right? But if you want to say, well, if you look at that word deny, and then, you know, people want to, to redefine things to a point of 
ridiculousness to just completely undermine what the passage is actually saying. People do that today. The hot button topic today is with homosexuality or sodomy. They want to try to pick apart the Bible so much as to say, oh, well, you know, Jesus didn't really talk about it. Oh, it's not really that bad of a thing. It's not really, you know, the Bible doesn't really say a whole lot about it. It's like, look, it's really, really clear. Okay? It's only unclear if you don't want to see it. If you don't want to see the truth, then all of a sudden it becomes unclear. If if you've been brainwashed enough by the, the society and the TV and the culture and everybody trying to say there's nothing wrong with it, You've been blinded, but the Bible still says what it says. It's not unclear. If God puts the death penalty on sodomy and and literally just uses words, if man shall lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, the two have committed abomination, they shall surely be put to death, the blood shall be upon them. I mean, there's not like getting around that. People like to make excuses. Oh, well, the problem with Sodom and Gomorrah is not that there was just homosexuality. It's that they were rapists, all this other stuff. It's like, look, the law settles that really, really clearly. Because it's not talking about rape. It's not talking about anything. It just says, if a man lies with mankind like he lies with a woman. Plain and simple. Oh, but the law, it's like, Look, God's not changing his mind on the morality of that. That's right. Yeah. Amen. He doesn't change his mind on that. It is what it is. You, you could deceive, try to deceive yourself. Right. But you know what? Those are people who strive about words to no profit. They want to fight with you about these words when it's real plain and clear what's being told and what's being taught and what's, what's being said. And watch out where people want to strive about words and no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Verse 15, he says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Hey, study for yourself. Study the word of God for yourself. Why don't you approve yourself unto God? You don't need to approve anyone else unto God. You don't need to show off anyone else how smart you are. Why don't you just learn the Bible and learn the word of God so you can show yourself approved unto God? Show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Hey, God has some work for you to do. He's got work for all of you to do. All of us. God has work for all of us to do. And you don't want to be a workman that's ashamed because you don't even know what he wants you to do. Get in his word. He'll tell you what he wants you to do. It's spelled out. Because what he wants you to do, he also wants other people to do too. Serious. What's the will of God? Why don't you read through the Bible and see when it says, for this is the will of God. There's a good start. Because you know what? There's plenty of verses like that in Scripture that tell you this is the will of God. Instead of wondering and trying to put a big question mark on it, let's start with that. And I guarantee if you start with the simple things in the Bible, that thought of where you wanted to have your own personal communication, where God's just literally spelling it out for you of what he wants you to do when you wake up in the morning so you go to bed at at night, you could forget about that and just focus on the things that are very clear here. And I said, once you do that, everything else will work itself out. Because the instruction he's given us here is plenty. It's enough. It's all we need. Study show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're not going to be able to rightly divide the word of truth if you don't study it, if you don't know anything about it. And again, we don't believe in dispensationalism here where they say, oh, rightly dividing is, you know, chopping it up and trying to mash it all together and and create weird doctrines. It's just understanding the whole thing. And and again, this goes along with the um, shunning versus not shunning. Because the next verse, look at the next verse, 16 is the one where it says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So, the same people who strive about words to no profit and just try to subvert the hearers, those are the ones that are bringing forth the profane and vain babblings. Now, profane, you might think of like profanity, right? But the profane babblings, profane is something that would be probably blasphemous. If you're profaning the word of God or using profane babblings that... um, kind of like bringing it down if you're profaning something you're making it dirt defiling is a good word right you're defiling something you're profaning it so 
the profane babblings or vain. Vain is just meaningless or empty. Right? Just just teachings. And I mean, even just the word babbling this goes along with that. The word babbling is just like could come from a baby. Baby's babble. I got a daughter. Right? That's what she does. That's a babbling, or just, uh, just unintelligible words, babbling, right? It's vain, it's empty, there's no meaning to it. There's no meaning to it at all. And there's people out there that want to talk about the Word of God and ultimately just have no meaning behind what they're saying. Right. And they could talk for hours and talk in circles and just have no real meaning. Right. Many, many times have you ever gone to a church and like, you come in and you just listen to a lot of words and you're just like, at the end of the day, you're, you're done. You're like, what was that about? Hey, what was the sermon about this morning? Huh? I don't know. Vain babblings. Do you have a point? Is there a point? What's a point? No one just wants to sit and just hear a bunch of talking. Give me a point. What, what am I learning? Pro, and profane is even worse because you're, you're actually doing damage, right? You're, 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 you're bringing a bad light on something. You're taking the word of God and just profaning it, right? Here's what the word of God means in truth, and then you're just taking that and, and just profaning it. That would be like what the devil does. The devil profanes the word of God. The devil tries to get Jesus to sin, and he tries to use scripture to do it, right? Oh, well, see, our, the angels, are, they're going to protect you. Right? Go ahead and just jump off this pinnacle here. Do it, because, hey, the scripture says this. Oh, if you really are the son of God, you'll do this. Or with Adam and Eve, yeah, hath God really, did God really say that? No, you, no, you're not surely going to die. He's profaning the word of God, because yes, they will. In the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's what God said. And Satan's saying, nah, you're not really going to die. He's profaning the word of God. And that's what people will do. That's what a lot of false prophets will do, too, right. is they'll use vain babblings and profane the word of God. And the Bible says that that's what we need to be shunning. We don't give place to that. Just like when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they're out preaching the gospel of the Gentiles, and then they come across these guys that say, well, wait a minute, we need to preach circumcision too. And he says, you know what? We gave place to them, not, no, not for an hour. So we didn't even, we're not going to entertain that thought. Like we know salvation is by grace through faith. I'm not going to entertain this discussion of, well, maybe there's works involved too. Well, maybe you need to be baptized too. Well, maybe, you know, no. You're not going to come and teach me something other than what we've received as being the truth and know to be the truth and just entertain that. I'm just going to shun that and say, no, that's not right. Because when you don't shun it, it says they will increase unto more ungodliness. When you spot the profane and vain babblings, it's time to just cut it off. Because if you let these people get a foothold and get an ear in, they'll end up influencing and corrupting you at some point, and it's going to increase unto more ungodliness. You just got to learn how to shut, you know, shun it out when you spot the profane and vain babblings. And we're going to get to this a little later, but just keep this in mind. There's a difference between people who want to learn that may have a false belief or a false doctrine but are willing to listen to you teach them the right way versus other people who want to just tell you no, no, no this is the way it is this is, you know, there's a difference between the two because that's really important when we get down later to being you know, humble and meek and, and trying to, to persuade people Right? Because we do want to reach people. But the people that want to strive, notice that too. That was in verse 14. Strive about words to no profit. They want to fight about it. And then they have profane and vain babblings. This is going to give you the key of, of who we need to be shunning when it comes to that stuff. I mean, it says literally shun profane and vain babblings. They'll increase unto more godliness. And uh, if you want to keep your place there, just flip backwards to 1 Timothy chapter 6. It'll just be a page or two back because it's the last chapter in 1 Timothy. You're in 2 Timothy 2. Is another warning. And this is interesting too just because these are both epistles to Timothy. The Apostle Paul is writing unto him both times, giving him this advice, giving him the word of God, teaching him here. And he warns him about the profane and vain babblings two times. 
So in the first one is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. He says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. So his last warning unto Timothy at there, he's just saying, hey, Timothy, you know, watch out for these profane and vain babblings. And then he also adds the oppositions of science falsely so called. Because these people, they're going to come at you with reasons of their own, right? They're, they're, profane, they're, they're profane or profanity and their vain babblings. To them, they think it's going to make sense and they're try, going to try to influence people with those things. But then they're also going to include, you know, some, many, you know, some people will include this oppositions of science falsely so-called. And just the concept, just understanding that, there, that such a thing exists is really important. Because in our modern culture as well, science is elevated, like in, in many people's minds, above religion or above the, I should say above the word of God. That's right. I don't want to use the word religion. I want to use the word, the word of God, okay, the Bible. That if the Bible says something, but so-called science says something different, then we go with science. No. No. Because the problem is that True science and the Bible are 100% compatible. That's not a problem. That's the truth. The Word of God is true in every instance. And true science is true in every instance, too, because it's, it, science is just knowledge. It's a, it's, a, it's a pursuit of knowledge and understanding and learning about things and, and you know, the, the world around us. The Bible isn't anti-science. And science isn't anti-Bible if it's true science. The problem comes in is when people want to tell you that, you know, we came from monkeys. Okay, and that, and that animals evolved into humans. And they call that science. And that's not science. I'm sorry. If you think that's science, you have been deceived because they want you to think that's science. But no one has observed any type of creature evolving into any other type of creature. They take certain things that look similar and that, and that you could observe and see, and then they apply that more broadly than you can apply it, and they call that science. And it's not science, my friends. And if, you know, if you're really interested in the subject, like I don't want to go on and on about this all night either because I easily can. This is one of the, the key turning points for me personally in my life, so I know a lot about this subject. And I'd be happy to talk to you about it because it was important to me. I'd be happy to talk to you if it's something that's important to you and point you in the right direction into other sources of information that you might not have seen before. Because I was the person growing up who was always really, really good at two subjects, math and science, my top two subjects. Today, I'm a computer programmer. I understand, you know, logic and reasoning. It's the way my mind works. And I still have interest in all those things. But growing up in the public, the public fool system, I was taught the foolish ideology that there is no God through science. It wasn't direct. No one came out and said there is no God at school. But they taught us science in these science books that says we came from monkeys. And the monkeys came from some other lower organism. They came from some other lower organism. They came from, you know, and you go back down this whole tree. Well, where's God in that? No, there's no, I mean, that's just what happened. Oh, if you want to believe in some God, that's go ahead. But that's not what Genesis says. I was taught evolution as fact. The theory of evolution, I was taught it as fact. And I used to think that anyone who didn't believe that was a moron. Oh, you're an idiot. Oh, you're uneducated. You're ignorant. You're stupid. You don't understand science. Because that's the attitude that science brings about the theory of evolution. And that social conditioning works really well. It works on people. It worked on me. And it works on a lot of people. Into just having that mindset. Into thinking that way. And the school system, they teach you how to be a good student and not how to challenge what you hear and really learn for yourself what is the truth. I got programmed really well, and I was a good student. And you can give me a list of facts or 
you know, so-called facts. You give me that stuff, and I can learn them, and I can repeat them. But the independent critical thinking is the re- is where you find the real truth. And that's where the real scientific method lies, too, is uncover this stuff. And to not have your, ge- your agenda dictate what your answer is going to be when you're trying to find out what the truth is. And I'll tell you what, when you find the truth, it's going to line up exactly with what this book says. And you will never find anything. You say, well, what about the fossils? The fossils don't prove anything. Again, I don't want to go down that whole rabbit trail. Talk to me. If that's something that you think is a problem for you or that you, you want to know what, like, what am I talking about here, I'll spend that time with you gladly after service or another day. I'd be happy to point you in a direction. of Because uh, once, I, I, once I got saved, first of all, when I got saved, I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when the blinders came off. The very first thing, well, one of the, one of the first things that I thought about after that within a very short period of time, was, well, what about evolution? Because that's how strongly I held to that belief. But once I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I was putting my faith in the Word of God, too. I was putting my faith in the Bible, and I knew what the Bible said about creation, and I believed that. So now what I wanted to do is reconcile, well, how does evolution work? Because I know that they don't, they don't teach the same thing. And that's when I got onto other resources. That's when I started to understand, oh, the radiocarbon dating, that sounds so scientific. When you really dig into it and you really see how it works and you see the methodology that they use, you'll start to see the holes and the flaws and the assumptions that they make that they can't prove behind their science. And you start to see that you can't have definitive Certainty in any of this stuff. And they talk about half-lives. We talk about the half-life of something you don't know what it started with. You can know how long it takes to decay for, for half of the life. Half the, well, how much carbon did it start with? Right now, we know the conditions of the earth and what that decay is going to be. But what if the conditions were different? You don't know that. You don't know. You can't prove it. And, and that's the thing is that they want to make you think and throw out all these terms. Oh, no, we got it all figured out. And these people are all really smart. Don't pull back the curtain. Don't see the man behind the curtain who's pulling the strings. And you know what? People try to do this. People try to use this, this appeal to authority, which is a logical fallacy all the time today. I'll give you a perfect example of that. Where did this six-foot social distancing thing come from? How scientific is that? Seriously. Do you think, because here's what they'd have you to believe, is, oh, no, it's six feet, because this is a standard. This is what the CDC says. This is what these really smart people say. Do you think that they had a group of people, okay, let's get the tape measure, and we're going to big ruler, and we're going to talk, and we're going to measure, and we're going to see, is there a droplet here? Is there... They're not doing that. They're making a guess. They're saying, well, when people talk, it could go, you know, I mean, some particles could fly out of your mouth. They'll probably go about this. You could visualize it's going to go down here. That's what they're doing. There's no real science behind it and taking all these measurements and stuff, okay? But the way that they sell it to you, it's just, hey, man, we need to have six feet. I mean, don't break that. Don't, don't cross that imaginary line because once you do, man, that, forget about it. That's the fear they want to put. But see, these are the things, though, we need to learn. Question it. Okay, I'm not even going to say they're always wrong. It's, it's question what you're being told. Get to the truth of the matter. Use real science. And don't get caught up in these oppositions where people want to oppose God's word and call it science. Oh, no, no, but this is scientific. Oh, yeah, you have faith, you believe in God, but I, I believe it's science. People make science their God. That's right. Because they don't want to accept the Bible as truth, so they have to come up with an alternate explanation, their own religious belief. They just happen to call it science. Right. And again, there's a distinction between real science and science falsely so-called. Right. And people like to blur the two to make it one, and it's not one. But just as people use profane and vain babblings to deceive people, and to fight about these words and to, and to just subvert hearers, they'll also use the science falsely so-called. And Timothy's being warned about all of that here. 
So going back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16, but shun, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So he's saying also their word is going to, it's just going to eat as a, I mean, a canker, you know, a canker sore, those hurt, man, those are just like, and they kind of spread, they get a little bit bigger, and it's just with every word, every bite, every, you know, it's just always there. It's a thorn in your side, right? Or a thorn in your mouth. And that's the way that their word eats. It's, it's destructive. It's no good. It's kind of like a cancer, right? You need to just cut it out, get rid of it, put some salt on that wound and let it heal up. But it, what, what I like about this, what I think is interesting about this is that he's naming names now of people. He says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. And this is in the word of God. And he's saying, you know who's doing this stuff? I'll tell you who's doing this stuff. Hymenaeus and Philetus is doing this stuff. So he's getting real specific. Hey, you need to shun profane and vain babblings. And let me tell you, here's two good examples of who's doing this. Hymenaeus and Philetus. So don't get all upset when the preacher stands up and says, hey, there's some false prophets out there. There's some false teachers out there. They've got some profane teachings and doctrines as profaning the word of God, like saying that it's not the blood of Jesus Christ that, that washes away your sins. Right. Like John MacArthur says... Right. Okay, that we need to shun those profane babblings by heretical teachers Amen. and have nothing to do with them. Right. And when you spot the profanity, just be done with it and call out the name of the heretic. Right. Don't have a problem with that when the Apostle Paul is doing the exact same thing here with Timothy, Timothy and teaching him, hey, Hymenaeus and Philetus, watch out for these guys. They've got profane teachings. Vain babblings. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Hymenaeus is brought up again, or again for the first time, right? So we're in 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible reads, this charge, uh, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy in 1 Timothy that there's some people, he's telling Timothy, hey, holding faith and a good excuse me, a good conscience. That, that's what he needs to do. But some people have put away that good stuff, you know, concerning faith. They've made shipwreck. They made a big disaster out of it. They took the faith that should be so easily understood and just made a big disaster, a big shipwreck out of it. And who did that? Hymenaeus and Alexander. Right. And as a result of them striving about words to no profit, and making a big, muddy mess of the word of God. He says, what did he do? I have delivered them unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And these guys are blaspheming the word of God. I thought we're supposed to have compassion and, and love and understanding. You do. But learn the appropriate time and place for that. There's a time to love. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to re refrain from embracing. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to weep. There's a time and place for all this stuff. Amen. Okay? And with these false prophets, and they're blaspheming the word of God, and they're, and they're striving about these words, and they're subverting the hearers, you know what? It's time to say, you know what? You're delivered unto Satan now. Satan can have his way with you now. He could just destroy your flesh. And here's the purpose of that. First Corinthians, you have to turn to 1 Corinthians 5, 5 says, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Saying sometimes people just need to learn the real, real hard way. Correct. Nebuchadnezzar was one of those people. <laughs> he had to learn the hard way. When he got lifted up with pride and he said, oh man, look at this kingdom. Look at all this stuff that I did. God's like, oh really? Fool, I'm the one who elevated you to this status because I wanted to get my will done. And he became a beast. He became like an animal out in the field, in the dew. His fingernails grew out like, like eagle's claws and his, and his hair became like feathers. I mean, he was just out in elements for a really long time until he realized there is a God in heaven. <laughs> and you know what? He's the one that allows for this stuff to happen. Not me. And that brought him down. And 
you know, I'm not saying that he was delivered unto Satan, but it's the same type of thing. You're delivering someone unto Satan, saying, okay, go ahead, Satan, just have your way with them. Because they need to be brought really low, hopefully for the saving of the soul. The spirit. Uh, verse number 18 here, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Right, go back to chapter, if you went back to chapter 1, go back to chapter 2. We're going to continue on here, verse number 18. And again, just more clues of who we're dealing with here. This Hymenaeus, Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. Erred means they've made an error. They've made a mistake. They're wrong. They're wrong about the truth. They're teaching lies. Saying that the resurrection is past already. So their heresy is that they're saying, oh yeah, that because what are we looking for? We're looking for that first resurrection, aren't we? The Bible teaches us that Christ was the first fruits. And then at his coming, there's that first resurrection when he comes back. That's when the, when the dead in Christ shall arise, right? And we're going to meet the Lord in the air and we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's, that event is going to happen. And then at the end is that second resurrection, okay? And these guys are saying, oh, yeah, that resurrection's already happened. We have hope in the resurrection, we have our hope in Christ, and they're saying, oh, yeah, that's already happened. And what do they do But when they, when they say that? It says, and overthrow the faith of some. Well, wait, what do you mean? I, I thought that people were literally going to be rising. Oh, no, yeah, that already happened. You know who makes claims like this? The cults do that. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Seventh-day Adventists. They make these claims. Oh, yeah, Jesus came back already. You just didn't see him. I'm sorry, the Bible says that every eye shall see him. Right. When he comes back, it's like the lightning that shines from the east and goes unto the west, and then everybody's going to see him. You're telling me he came back already? Sorry. No. Profane, vain babblings shun you. We don't have anything to do with you. Don't be coming here trying to teach that garbage. That overthrows the faith of some. You start teaching things contrary to what the Bible clearly says. Clear statements, clear teachings. No. And especially about the resurrection. And it's so important. What was the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? So how close is that talking about our resurrection? Oh yeah, the resurrection's already passed. That's our hope, is our resurrection in Jesus Christ. Verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having a seal, having this seal, excuse me, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. So here's another thing. You know, and previously used the word shun for the, the profane and vain babblings, meaningless words. And here it's saying, you know what, the foolish and unlearned questions. And you know what, sometimes you run across people, they have a lot of questions. And I know you probably have heard there's no such thing as a stupid question, but there is. That's right. The Bible says it's a foolish question. You can call it stupid. It basically mean the same thing. There are such a thing as stupid questions. Okay? And the Bible just says, avoid them. Okay, don't, don't get caught up in that. If you get caught up, if you go out soul winning and you try to reach people with the gospel and they just have all these questions and you just start going down, all, you're never going to get the gospel across that person anyways. Yep. Your best bet is just to avoid it. I mean, people will say, well, what about, what about UFOs? What about, it? what about Sasquatch? What about, what about uh, you know, all right, look, man. We're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ here. We're talking about you being a sinner. We're talking about Jesus Christ and what he did. Let's not get into all this other stuff, okay? We avoid that stuff. Knowing that, because all you're going to get out of that then is just, it says there's going to gender strife. So you're going to create problems, create fights. Look, 
We don't, we don't need to get into foolishness. And that's why I'm not going to debate with someone who's trying to tell me that the earth is flat. Seriously. I'm serious. Because it's foolish. It is fool, It would be a foolish pursuit to try to do such a thing. Because those people are willfully ignorant. They don't, for I don't know what the reason is why they don't want to believe the truth in that area, but that's craziness. It's crazy town. If, unless they just simply really don't have the smarts at all to just understand some basic, basic stuff. I mean, it's another rabbit trail. Don't want to go down that. I'm going to avoid that foolish foolishness and, and unlearned questions. We're going to avoid that. All it's going to do is gender strifes. And notice the people that, that are caught up in that, you'll notice it, they can't let it go. They cannot let it go. I did, all right, I said I was going to get past it. One more thing. I, did, I just remembered this. I did a search for my name once, and there's some, because it'll, it'll search, if you search in Google, it'll search the Google, um, like if there's books, if there's books on Google that like you could rent or buy or whatever. I don't even know how it all works. But some flat earther like referenced me in some book that they put out, and it was so funny. <laughs> I was like reading this stuff. Like, are you serious? And I don't think anyone's really reading it. Because, you know, anyone, anyone can, these days can write a book and put it on the internet or whatever. But um, what was my point with that? What was the point? Oh, so I'm reading this, right, in the context. And he's basically saying that, like, I'm not even saved. And everything is about the flat earth. And how everyone, everyone's deceived, and then once people understand this, then they'll get saved. It's like their gospel has become the, the earth, the shape of the earth. Yeah. It, whether or not the earth is, is round, sphere, glow, you know, flat, pear shape, whatever, like that is what's going to get people saved. Sorry. You've gone way off the deep end into total, utter absurdity. Because I, I don't care what the earth looks like from however far above it and the shape it makes. I think there's plenty of evidence to show what it is, but it doesn't matter. Because what really matters, the real truth of the gospel has nothing to do with that. And anyone who's going to say otherwise, is they, they've, they've got their priorities way out of whack and screwed up and they're fools. And I'm going to avoid those foolish questions. And, and that's why these people, it's, it's, they just want to start. We had, we had people, someone visit you know, periodically, and it's just like, he knew where I stood on this stuff, but just had to bring it up anyways. You just, you just got to bring it. You just got to insert that. You know what I did? I avoided it. Because what's it going to do? It's just, gonna, it's just geared to start a fight. No matter how much they say, oh, no, no, I don't want to fight. Oh, no, I'm not, try I'm not trying to do anything. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're gendering strife, even if you don't real. I mean, maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Maybe people don't realize it. You're gendering strifes. The foolish and unlearned questions, avoid them. Nothing to do with it. And here's where it says in verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance and acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. When we go forth and we avoid the foolish questions and the unlearned questions, we get to the more important things anyways. Because the foolish and unlearned, unlearned questions just means they don't know anything about the subject at all. But once they start to learn a little bit more, they'll start to realize, oh yeah, that was kind of a dumb question. I, should, I shouldn't have asked that. Because they'll learn the right things. So we avoid those things. It's just going to be a waste of time. It's just going to cause arguments and strifes and problems. And let's just focus on being gentle and able to teach people with patience um, and meekness to struggle those that oppose themselves what the truth is. We teach them. But you can only do that with people who are willing to be taught and listen. 
when you've got people that just won't stop, as the Bible says in Titus 3, you turn there if you'd like, you're in 2 Timothy, just flip forward a page or two to Second Tim- or excuse me, to Titus chapter 3. Titus 3 verse 9, the Bible reads, But avoid foolish questions, right there it is again, and genealogies. So the genealogies, by the way, would be, Oh, am I the seed of, of, of Israel? Am I the seed of Abraham? Am I the seed of, what tribe am I of? And it used to be where this would apply to the Jews, right? The genealogies, because they want to prove. But these days, it applies to <laughs> it applies to like so many different groups. You've got on one hand, you've got the Black Hebrew Israelites. You've got these other Hebrew roots people. You've got other people saying, you know, no, the white people are the true Jews. I mean, they came from. No, it's the black people are the true Jews. No, it's this group. It's like. The Bible says avoid genealogies. Right, right. I don't care. I don't care who physically, literally descended from Abraham because God doesn't care who physically, literally descended from Abraham. It doesn't matter. Amen. What matters is if you're in Christ. That's, right. that's what matters. Right. Seriously, that's what matters. It doesn't matter. All this other, And people want to go to these genes. Oh, no, look, we can prove this back and see if you look. You just don't know your history, right? They want to puff themselves up with pride and think that they know some knowledge that no one else knows and we're so smart. Look, Avoid that stuff. Because all it's going to do with you is get you in an argument and a fight, and it's going to be unproductive. You're going to waste a whole bunch of time. That's right. Amen. And it doesn't matter if you can beat them up one side down another with knowledge, with facts, with, with counter. It doesn't matter. Because when they're, when they're involved in foolish questions, nobody wins. When you're involved with foolish questioning, no one wins. Because a fool is not going to learn and, and turn, you know, Hey, if, if you got someone who's willing to listen and let you try to teach them, it's a different story. Yeah. But when they when they come and just try to teach you and oh man, you see them. Wait, right, you turn to Titus chapter three, verse nine. But avoid foolish questions, genealogies, and contentions, right? Just fightings and strivings about the law. They're unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. You give them a chance, you give them a second chance, done. Reject, shun the vain and profane babblings. Done with it, right? You gave an opportunity and said, okay, here you go. Oh, you're not going to accept that? Here's another one. Uh, Okay. Reject. You're heretic. Done. But when you get people who will listen and they'll have an actual, even if they have a very, because look, we're not like afraid of people who have opposing views, right? And we're not scared of it. And we're also not trying to become a cult that removes us from any opposing views and just isolate ourselves either. We go out to reach people. We go out to engage. We go out to have communication and talk. But what we also do and what we primarily do is try to teach people because we have been studying the Bible. Hopefully, right? You should be. I am. We should be studying this. We've already put our faith in Christ. We want to explain to other people that salvation is a free gift. We want to show that to them. And in the course of doing so, their own you know, people's beliefs are going to come up. But we're going to say, okay, here, look, I want to tell you what I believe. I'm going to show you what the Bible says. You can choose to believe that or not. Right? At the end of the day, as much as I do appreciate and have conversations with people and I want to connect with them, I also don't want to spend my whole day here telling me everything about what you believe. Because if you're believing some false god and some false religion, I don't need to know that much about it. But I can show you what the Bible says. Would you like to hear that? And if you have an objection, that's fine. You know, we can talk about it. I could give you some explanation. Like, here you go. Well, here's what the Bible says. It's up to you. Accept it or reject it. Right? But I'm not going to waste a bunch of my time dealing with a heretic that's going to try to teach me why, no, 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 you can only call God's name Jehovah. And if you think, you know. No. The Bible says that there's a name that's above every other name. It's the name of Jesus Christ. So, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Jehovah. Okay, Jehovah's in the Bible too. It's a great name. It's not the only name. I'm not going to focus my time on that just as much as I'm not going to focus my time on the shape of the earth. 
<laughs> in fact, I would be. I think it's more important what God's name is than the shape of the earth is. So, like, the, you know, if, if I'm going to gauge people on, on where they're at, of just like level of important stuff. Sorry, flat earthers. Jehovah's Witnesses are more important than you <laughs> with, their, with their with their false doctrine and false belief. Last last place I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to you, Romans 16, uh, verse 17. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So there's one more example of avoidance, of shunning, of not having anything to do with it. In every instance, what we're seeing is that the purpose of what they're doing is to cause problems. They're gendering strifes, they're, they're bringing contentions, they're bringing fightings, okay? We're called to be in unity and called to be at peace in our doctrine and what we believe, especially here in the church. We're not supposed to be fighting about this stuff. And if someone wants to come up and fight about it, you know, I'm going to avoid it and I'm going to reject it. And if you've got people that are causing divis- divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you've already learned and believe, the doctrine that we believe here as a church, if people want to come in and try to cause division, we'll tell each other, oh, no, well, actually, this is, you know, we're going to mark and avoid those people. It's not because we can't be challenged in what we believe, but you're trying to come in and cause division. There's a huge difference between having a difference of opinion and trying to cause division. Huge difference. A lot of it has to do with how you go about things. See, if people cause division, they're going to go about sneakily and try to, to get in under the radar. Other people will be out in the open with it. And, you know, we're a church that I bet you if you talk to every single person in this church, there's going to be different things that people believe that don't 100 percent in every aspect that, you know, line up exactly with what I say. And you know what? That's OK. I mean, I hear from the guys in the preaching class and they teach some things that are a little bit different than what I believe or what I've seen. And you know what? That's OK. Because none of those things are like major doctrines. None of those things are designed to cause strife and and divisions. And none of them are foolish questions and and going on about genealogies and stuff like that. It's all just some difference of opinions. That's fine. And that's healthy. And that's normal. But when it comes to the, the false prophets, the vain babblings, the profane teachings, we shun that stuff. We don't give place to that. We don't, we don't allow that type of stuff in. Yes, we want to reach people and, and be long-suffering and, and, and everything, but we're not going to deal with the division and the, the, the vain and profane babblings where it subverts the hearers. Okay? And you've got to be able to decide. There's too many individual instances to go into that. You're just going to have to take that truth and understand Okay, there's a time that where I just need to just shut this off and just have nothing to do with this anymore. Let's bow as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for uh, the wisdom that we can receive through your word. I pray that you would please help us to take this knowledge and to take these words and be able to apply them on a regular basis in our life. Dear Lord, help us to know when the appropriate time is when we should be um, using this, the shunning of the profane and vain babblings as, as you've taught here. Um, versus just being really meek and, and long-suffering and, and everything, Lord, and, um, and not shunning and, and being open. Help us to understand the differences and, and what, what's appropriate at which time. And um, God, I pray that you would please just continue to, to work through our church, help our church to grow, and, and that you would add more members to our church and help us to reach more people and uh, increase our wisdom and our knowledge and give us the, the faith and the spirit to go out and, um, and really do something good with your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.